A warm welcome uh, to all of you for the fourth and final BHS webinar uh, this autumn. And today we're treated to a presentation by Professor Amy Fowler on anthropogenic intensification of short duration rainfall extremes. Um, Haley is a professor of climate change impacts within the School of Engineering at Newcastle uh, University. And last month she began her role as BHS president-elect, having previously served on committee as an elected member and honorary secretary. Um, so I understand Haley's presentation today will center on the findings of the intense research program into sub-daily rainfall extremes. What trends are present, how we can model, and what are the impacts on these extremes of people-induced climate changes? And I think the presentation will focus primarily on the latter. Um, and I'm delighted to, to give a presentation today, a webinar to the um, BHS. So, I mean, Nick has said a bit already about, um, about the fact that most of the work that I'm going to be presenting today is about is from the intense project i'll say a little bit more about that in a second um, but what i really wanted to do today was um, tell you a little bit about the blue skies research we did in that five-year project um, something about some of the conclusions we've come to in terms of the potential for the intensification of short duration rainfall extremes um, from global warming um, but then also say a bit about how that is likely to impact on flash flooding um, and particularly um, around what we might think about doing about it, because I think that's the important thing here. Um, you know, it's what it's all very well to do blue sky science and sometimes it's really necessary and I think it's it's really interesting. Um, but um, it's actually having that impact on practice as well. Um, and that strategic importance of doing that research in the first place to have an impact on practice um, that we all need to think about. So, as I say, most of the work certainly that I'm going to start by talking about was done under the intense project. Um, and that was a very large project funded by the European Research Council. Um, and in particular that um, looked for the first time really at what we what 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 we expect in terms of um, the nature and the drivers of extreme sub daily rainfall. Prior to this time, there'd really been very little research on sub daily rainfall extremes. Um, in the fifth assessment report from the IPCC, there's quite a lot of information on what might happen and what is happening to daily and longer duration extreme rainfall, but very little on sub-daily. And I'm glad to say that um, certainly the two chapters that I'm involved in for the um, sixth assessment report, the extremes chapter and the water cycle chapter, there's a lot of information in there now on what uh, potential changes there, there are projected to be um, and that we've seen already to extreme sub-daily rainfall. So that's a really good outcome from the project. The project um, looked at um, five aspects um, of sub-daily rainfall. So how has it changed in observations? Um, how is it related to thermodynamic changes? So that's um, changes in temperature and moisture. And how is it related to um, large scale atmospheric variability? Then to use very sophisticated new climate models called convection permitting models, which I'll say a little bit about later, um, to see how these extremes will respond to warming. And then finally, how can we use all of this information we understand already from theory and um, from observations and from models to actually better inform adaptation? And I think that's key here and that's crucial that we take our science through to use it in practice. Of course, there's a huge team involved in this um, process, not just myself, a number of postdocs, um, now research fellows, some academics at Newcastle University, um, a number of partners at uh, KNMI, including Gert Lenderink, um, Lizzie Kendon and her team at the UK Met Office, absolutely crucial. Lizzie's really leading the field in terms of convection permitting modelling um, and other intense partners around the world. So we all know um, already 
that there's a there's a strongly linear relationship um, between carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and global mean surface temperature. And we've we've hit the peak um, carbon dioxide um, concentration in the atmosphere earlier this year at about 419 parts per million. And that's obviously increasing. Global mean surface temperature is increasing alongside that. Um, but there's also theoretical and fundamental physical reasons that extreme precipitation intensities um, and indeed, indeed mean precipitation should also increase with temperature. There's this relationship um, called clausius clapeyron which basically is a relationship between the specific humidity of the atmosphere um, and the temperature. And you can see there that um, I've put um, a relatively simple graph in that shows how the amount of water in the air varies, um, and that's on the y-axis, with the temperature of that air parcel. Um, and you can see that the relative humidity actually matters as well. Um, but don't, don't think about that for now. And I guess that red line there shows the dew point 100% um, relative humidity. And that is the point at which we would expect it to start raining. And this shows this clausius clapeyron relationship. So it's a fundamental theoretical, but also a real empirical relationship um, that means that a warmer atmosphere holds more moisture. And actually, um, this moisture in the atmosphere and this, um, I suppose, clausius clapeyron relationship suggests that um, this increase is about six and a half percent for every degree rise in temperature. And because extreme precipitation happens at this dew point, as I say, then we'd expect that these extreme precipitation intensity should also increase at about this rate. Um, Kevin Trenmark birth. Um, published a landmark paper in 2003, um, and he talked about um, this, as well as the fact that um, we also expect um, increases and changes in duration and frequency characteristics of rainfall as well as these changes to intensity. And this is because um, there are energy constraints on evaporation and evapotranspiration from the surface. Because of that, we expect total rainfall will only increase at about a rate of one to two percent per degree of warming. Um, and because the extremes are increasing at a faster rate, we therefore need to have changes in duration and frequency as well. And so ironically, this means that we will get increases in the number of drought events as well as the number of these extreme rainfall events, potentially. So the other thing we knew when we started the um, intense project and the, the reason that we were very, very interested in what might happen to um, short duration rainfall extremes is the fact that um, Gitlenderink had published this paper with his colleague, Eric van Meijgaard in 2008. Um, and they looked at the relationship between um, intense precipitation and the day-to-day -day variability in temperature. So these graphs here show um, the relationship for different quantiles, different percentiles of that precipitation distribution um, for different temperatures. And you can see along the x-axis there, uh, the temperature and intensity of rainfall is along the y-axis. And what they found was that looking at this day-to-day -day variability um, for the high percentiles, so those most extreme events, for daily rainfall, they really closely follow this clausius clapeyron relationship. So as temperature increases, you see about a 6.5% increase um, per degree of warming in the intensity of these daily extremes. But interestingly for hourly, um, again, for the day-to-day -day variability, and here we're not looking at the actual climate change signal, um, we found they found much higher increases in the hourly rainfall intensities. Um, and these were about double what, we, what they were seeing for daily. So around 13% um, increase per degree warming. And so the question really we're asking in the intense project is, will hourly precipitation intensities increase at this faster rate that's been found in this day-to-day -day variability um, with this warming of climate that we're seeing with climate change, this anthropogenic 
influence on our climate. Um, and as I've said already, um, climate change will cause more heavy rainstorms um, and flooding, as well as heat waves and droughts. Um, and you can see there the sort of storm that I'm talking about with short duration rainfall extremes. This is taken from Instagram. Um, a guy is watching his neighbor literally drown um, in a convective storm here in Canada. And you can also see here, um, this is Chennai, um, basically their, their water supply running out in a drought in 2019. So we're already living um, at the moment in a world that is one degree warmer. The global mean surface temperature is one degree warmer than pre-industrial times. Um, and that obviously is having an effect already on the type of extremes we're experiencing. Um, and this just to give you an example of this, and this is very difficult to quantify for these short duration extremes because they're very intermittent in space and time. But this is some work that was done for tropical cyclones um, and particularly for Hurricane Harvey that happened obviously and had a huge impact on Houston in 2017. And you can see there the sort of daily rain, um, sorry, three day, I think it is, rainfall amounts um, that came from this system. So over 800 millimeters of rainfall it, over a large proportion of Houston. And actually studies that have looked at this found that the warming of one degree that we've seen so far um, from anthropogenic climate change intensified the rainfall associated with Harvey by about 18%, um, but also made stalling more likely. So it's all, also thought to be slowing down these storms. And this comes in later as well in the talk because this isn't just associated with tropical cyclone systems, but with other types of systems, both cyclones and these convective systems as well. So the point I wanna get across is we're already experiencing highly extreme events in a one degree world. And with our um, pledges to Paris, um, we are expecting to see about a three degree warming by the end of this century. Um, at the moment, although we're obviously trying to stay to that two degree warming with, with the Paris Agreement. So these things are gonna get worse. So will short duration precipitation intensities increase at a faster rate with climate warming? One of the things we, um, we aim to do in the intense project, and this work was led by um, Liz Lewis, who's now um, a lecturer at Newcastle University, um, is to collect together the first data set of sub-daily rainfall observations globally. And you can see here, this is the number of stations that, um, that she managed to collect. So we've got over 26,000 hourly um, stations around the world. And again, you can see here, we've also developed a way of quality controlling this data set, um, which will be released open source and a paper is um, about to be submitted on this at the moment. So that will be very useful for the community as well. Um, and there's some of those records, particularly the national records that we've managed to um, collect from uh, MET agencies are very useful and actually provide very long um, and quite high quality data sets on sub daily rainfall extremes. The other thing um, that we've, we really used within the project and also um, ran new simulations within the intense project as well, are these what I call convection permitting uh, climate models. And you can see here, um, these are the continental domains around the world that are now covered by these convection permitting models. And really to say that this is something that's taken off in the last um, eight years or so, really led um, from the group at um, the UK Hadley Centre and Lizzie Kendon. And what I mean by um, convection permitting climate models are, they're really, um, I mean, certainly the UK Met Office model is the same model that we use for weather forecasting in the UK, the UKV. So it's effectively a weather forecast model. Um, and it's it's got a very fine resolution grid spacing. And these models have a, a resolution of less than four kilometers. 
they're able to explicitly represent convection without the need for parameterization. Um, and they've been included in the latest climate projections for the UK. We've done a lot of work on this um, as part of the intense project um, in the international community um, and assessed and evaluated different model simulations around the world. And we found that, that really um, they are needed to provide robust projections of changes to the duration and the intensity of convective rainfall in the warm season. And just to give you an example of um, how this works and the improvements that we see to the timing of the diurnal cycle and um, the representation of extremes within these models, this is actually a weather forecast um, here, but the, the same properties are true of the future climate simulations. Um, so this shows um, the flash flood event that happened in Boscastle on the 16th of August, 2004, and this shows um, the UKV forecast of the rainfall associated with that event for 2 p.m. Um, that day um, from different resolution weather forecast models along the bottom there. And you can see there's a 12 kilometer model, which is the resolution of um, the current generation of regional climate models used in the UK climate projections. Uh, there's a four kilometer model and a one kilometer model and there's, there's also um, radar, so that's the radar observations at the top there. What you can see immediately is that at the 12 kilometer scale, you can't reproduce the sort of intensities, um, which are shown in that scale at the bottom there, that happen in reality from that radar, those radar observations. So you're seeing up to 32 millimeters, perhaps higher than that per hour. 12 kilometer model, very low rainfall intensities, at four kilometers, you're able to reproduce better <clears throat> those rainfall intensities, but really not the convec convective banding of the system that you see in reality, and actually um, cause that really intense flash flooding episode in Boscastle. But at one kilometers, you're able to really reproduce those sort of features. So these are the sort of models we now use to actually provide projections of the future and that we use, I'm gonna show you some results of um, about, well, I suppose we use them to basically understand better the physical processes associated with these changes as well for the future. So this is quite a complicated um, diagram, but um, I wanted to include it here. So, um, on the, the left there is a study that was published by Eric Fisher and Rito Nutti in Nature Climate Change in 2016. Um, and it's showing the change in frequency um, for different percentiles of daily precipitation. And you can see the most extreme rainfall is on the right of, and, and going down to the 90th percentile, which is less extreme. And you see very heavy precipitation and heavy precipitation there. Um, and what it's showing is the change in that very or heavy precipitation between two time periods. So looking at 1981 to, to, to 2013 and comparing that to the historical period from 1951 to 1980. Um, and the main message to take away from this is that they found that the, the most heavy events are changing the most. And you can see that quite significantly there. So change in frequency is you know 45 percent of those very heavy events but also that that change is actually consistent with Clausius clapeyron scaling so changes around six and a half percent per degree of warming and you can also see there that it's outside the range of natural variability from that resampled gray range there we did the same thing. Um, this was led by one of my postdocs, Selma Guerrero, who's now got a, um, a research fellowship at Newcastle University, um, looking at Australia. Um, and we did the same thing, but looked at daily rainfall and hourly rainfall. Um, and we used a very similar method, only we looked at what we've called K largest bins, which basically for the 20, for the 20 K largest bin, for example, we're looking at the 20 biggest events in that time period. We used slightly different time periods just because our records were slightly shorter um, because we had um, hourly rainfall here. 
Um, and we looked at the difference between the time period from 1990 to 2013 compared to 1966 to 1989. What we found was very similar for daily rainfall. We found that that, um, that change um, was consistent with Clausius clapeyron scaling, so around six and a half percent per degree of warming, and also that it was within the range of natural variability, that grey shade in there from resampling. I'm not going to go into any of the technical details here, um, but if you're interested, read the paper. Um, but the hourly um, was much higher. So the change in magnitude for the hourly rainfall extremes was much, much higher. And actually those red lines there um, show a one, a two and a three times Clausius clapeyron scaling. And actually you can see that the most extreme events there for the hourly rainfall extremes are actually increasing around three times the rate of Clausius clapeyron and well outside that range of natural variability. So they're detectable above that natural variability. So we found that hourly can be much higher. This scaling, this change in hourly rainfall with warming can be much higher than um, the daily. And actually it's really interesting, but a paper was published just last week using our method on some data from China. And they found exactly the same thing that you find a two to three times Clausius clapeyron increase in the hourly extremes over China as well. So that's really interesting. Um, and hopefully that, that paper will be also reported in the IPC sixth assessment report. So that's, um, I've just said something about the changes to um, the peak intensity of uh, these short duration rainfalls. Um, but also of interest in terms of flooding is the changes to the storm um, temporal profile. So there's been some very interesting work done in Australia by Conrad Wasco and Ashish Sharma, um, and a lot of work done in this area. I'm only gonna talk about a few of their studies here. Um, and they looked at um, the potential changes to storm profile um, and link this to temperature. What they did was they split the storm up into these different segments, as you can see on the figure there, and then looked at um, how these changed basically with the different um, ambient temperature that the storm was associated with. And they found that with warmer temperatures, the most intense part of the storm always gets more intense. Um, and that's at the expense of the, um, the weaker parts of the storm. So in general, in Australia, the storm gets more intense, but that weaker part of the storm gets less intense. And in fact, the storm can actually reduce in duration. Of course, of interest to flooding as well is also um, changes to storm size. And there's been a few studies also looking at this. So um, there's been a couple of observational studies in Australia and the Netherlands, and one using convection permitting models um, in the US as well. Um, and although, <laughs> although they use the opposite um, color scheme for their figures, the two observational studies actually both find um, a intensification of the storm core. And you can see that um, what, what those two figures um, on the left are showing here is um, on the y-axis is the precipitation intensity and then the distance from the center of the storm on the x-axis. And you can see that um, the warmer storms, which are shown as red in the Wasco et al study, but weirdly blue in the Lockbyler et al study are more intense in the core. What you can also see is that the Australian storms become um, more intense, but smaller in size with warming, which is what we what I showed you in the previous slide. In the Netherlands, the storms actually become um, more intense, but actually bigger in size as well. And that actually, that actually is consistent as well with what's been found um, for, from convection permitting model studies in the US. And um, when they looked at um, the future under a RCP 8.5, um, so um, about a three degree warming by the end of the century scenario, um, they found that the storm not only becomes more intense in its core, but also becomes bigger as well. And of course, this has implications for flooding. And I think that it's really important that we think about these sorts of changes 
um, because it's that total event rainfall that matters. And actually it provides something like a twofold increase in the total event rainfall, which is much bigger than that intensification of just the peak intensity. We need to, to, to know these sort of things to understand the changing flood risk. The other thing to think about is that there will also be um, seasonality changes to extreme precipitation. This shows some work that's just been published in Climate Dynamics by Stephen Chan, um, who's based in Lizzie Kendon's team at the Met Office. This of course matters um, because when your extreme rainfall falls matters in terms of the antecedent moisture conditions and whether it will cause a flood or not. Um, in the current climate, certainly in Northern Europe, many of these extreme short duration events happen in the summer. In the future, there's certainly from our climate simulation, there's a, a big shift towards autumn um, in terms of these um, short duration rainfall extremes. Um, and so in the UK, um, and I thought I'd, I'd use this study here, which really started off this, um, it's the first time that a convection permitting model had been used to, um, to provide a projection of change to short duration rainfall extremes. Um, and this was a study that Lizzie and myself and other authors published in 2014 now, but really the fundamental message hasn't changed from this. Um, that actually, if we use a convection permitting model, um, we find very large changes to summer precipitation intensities um, but in the UK in the future of around 30 to 40 percent for these short duration one hour extreme events um, and larger increases than this in Scotland. Whereas if we use these standard regional climate models, we find very little change. Hourly events over 30 millimetres show a fivefold increase. Um, and of course, this, this has been used to provide revised guidance, and we're doing this again at the moment with UK CP18. So moving on to will flash flooding increase, because um, that's an important question. Um, I think there's, there's really some subtle changes to think about here, and there's lots of local scale effects all the way up to regional and global scale effects that matter when you think about changes to, to flood hazards. Um, and in particular, thinking about changes to the, the seasonality of rainfall are important. And the fact that all of our flood guidance at the moment is based on changes to annual maxima. And you can see on the left there that actually, if you start to think about the changes, so this is showing the average rainfall change per decade for different durations. And this is over Sydney, but the same thing could be true of other places in the world. That actually, if you look at what's happening over Sydney, you're getting an increase at all durations in summer rainfall extremes. Um, but for example, a decrease in winter rainfall extremes. If you look at the annual maxima, you actually uh, get a very mixed message. But actually, you need to be thinking much more about the seasonality of these extremes, how that's changing and how that relates to the potential flood hazard. Um, the other thing is that. Um, Although rainfall extremes tend to increase with temperature in a fairly linear fashion, actually stream flow doesn't. And of course that's because there's also a big impact of a warming climate on evaporation as well. And therefore, um, as you get more evapotranspiration from a catchment, the antecedent moisture conditions go down and therefore it perhaps is less likely to flood. So it's important um, to think about this because that means that small subcatchments that are perhaps less affected by these changes to evapotranspiration and more affected by um, the intensification of rainfall may exhibit very different flood trends or potential changes to the larger catchments. Um, and this of course translates through to, to looking at observed trends. And this is um, a study on the the left here um, by Gunter Blerschel, uh, published last year in Nature, looking at trends in river floods in Europe. And you can see there that you know you find very you find increases in the UK and some of northern Europe since 1960, but decreases in other regions. And of course, a lot of that is caused by natural variability. And it's really hard to, to find these significant trends 
um, and to work out whether they're happening because of um, anthropogenic warming or because of natural variability. Um, the study on the left, however, is very interesting, and that shows how um, precipitation um, changes um, with warming and how flow in different types of catchments changes with warming. And you can see there that actually you see this very positive relationship between rainfall change, sorry, temperature change and rainfall change. But actually you don't necessarily see the same thing. Um, so indeed for the largest catchments, you actually only start to get um, an increase in floods at the very extreme end of precipitation. So actually um, those larger catchments are much less affected by changes to extreme rainfall, whereas the smaller catchments are much more affected. And that's again because of this antecedent moisture conditions that I've been talking about. If we go into a little bit more detail again, um, this is a um, something that's going to come out really soon, actually, which is a really re a review of what I've just been showing and talking about in this talk, but with a lot more detail about the physical processes and um, the underlying um, physical atmospheric processes, as well as um, the flood processes. Um, and I haven't talked about urbanization, but there's also been a lot of work on how urbanization and the urban heat island effect also increases um, storm strength through increasing vertical uplift and moisture convergence over cities as well. Um, and you can see here, if you start to think about the processes causing flash flooding, um, then there can be very different effects in very in different locations um, because of uh, some kind of weird feedback going on at the moment. Um, okay. Um, and I wanted to say, as well, um, something about um, flood risk. And so far, I've really just been talking about flood hazard. Um, this is something that's about to um, be published as part of the third UK climate change risk assessment by Paul Sayers. Um, and they looked at the influence of climate change on flood risk. Um, and also took account a little bit of vulnerability and exposure. Um, but probably there's not enough account taken of those two aspects so far, because of course our risk, or, um, our vulnerability and our exposure also really matters. We might not be able to influence um, how the hazard, <laughs> we might not be able to influence um, the hazard very much in terms of we can mitigate, um, but the hazard is changing but we can influence that vulnerability and exposure. And I think that's what I wanna talk about in the final part of the talk. What they found though, was that the, um, the hazard is the thing that's changing the most and the hazard of this change to extreme rainfall is the thing that's providing that the most increased risk with this change in global mean surface temperature. So I wanna finish by saying a little bit about how I think we need to provide improved climate change information for decision making and how we're trying to do this as a result of the intense work. Um, obviously, there's a whole load of other studies that were um, done as part of intense and I haven't had time to talk about all of those today. Um, I've actually put them listed most of them um, at the end of this slide pack, which I'm happy to share after the talk. It was like 40 or 50 publications. Um, so one of the things we've done as part of the intense project, um, and one of the things I think we need to continue to do is to think about um, producing new data sets to understand better current climate variability. And one of the data sets we produced, obviously we've produced this new quality controlled um, hourly rainfall gauge data set for the world. Um, and as part, we've used part of that then to actually produce a radar gauge satellite merged hourly product for the UK, which is um, we've now produced for 2003 to 2014. Um, and it's not available yet online, but hopefully will be fairly soon for, for the community to use. And this is important because actually gauge data really underestimates um, the frequency of these very intense rainfall events. 
and some analysis that we did and published in a paper this year in environmental research letters that you can see at the bottom there um, is um, showing how often these events are missed by gauges. And this shows um, data for Germany, um, but the same is also true of the UK. And you can see in those pie charts there that at one hour duration, um, the rainfall gauges from the German Met Service and other stations pick up less than a quarter of the events, these intense events that are picked up by the radar data. Whereas at the daily scale, they're picking up about 80% of those events. So it's really important that we actually start to use more than just gauge data to try and understand current climate variability, particularly for these short duration extremes. Of course, this will also help us understand better the spatial dimension of these storms and perhaps how that's changing as well. So the UK data set that we've produced for the, the blended data set is at one hour, one kilometer resolution for those that are interested. The other data set that's coming out of Intense, um, because we can't release all of this quality control gauge data globally, um, you know, because of restrictions from national MET services, <coughs> is that we're producing, or we have produced, um, a set of global sub-daily extreme precipitation indices, which we can actually um, release. So these will allow people to actually do extreme value analysis, to look at things like the diurnal cycle. They can also be used to assess um, convection permitting model simulations as well. So that will, is another data set that we're going to be releasing to the community. Um, another thing that I think is really important to think about and perhaps a bit, a bit offside in this talk, um, but um, in terms of translating this hazard through to risk, uh, um, and this is something for you hydrological modelers out there, um, are the current set of hydrological models we use actually sufficient for extreme events? Should we be using physically based models? Um, we actually need to think much more about the sequencing and clustering of rainfall. We can't just use delta chain me change methods. Um, some of the methods we use to apply um, climate change information um, to assess risk in terms of flooding in this country are just not adequate. We need to basically be thinking about how to do this much better. And also how do we better incorporate information on exposure and vulnerability. I also think we need to revise our methods for flood estimation. Um, we need to think about including non-stationarity and how we would do that. Um, the way we do this at the moment, we don't include non-stationarity. Um, we provide climate uplifts, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, but we only provide uplifts to peak intensity. So we might say, for example, well, increase the storm intensity by 20%. And we apply this blanket uplift. But actually, as, as I've shown already, there's a lot more to think about in terms of both the, the profile of the storm. You know, we need an up, update to potential storm profiles, for example. We need to um, include information on the changing storm characteristics, such as duration, such as um, this, this change in the peak intensity and in the core of the storm compared to the rest of it, the changes in the spatial aspects as well, and the clustering in space and time. Um, we also need to make climate change risks and risk information much more relevant to decision makers. Um, so I'm showing here some work that we did with uh, Murray Dale um, in 2017, where we updated the climate uplifts for sustainable urban drainage in the UK. And you can see that we came up with some different regional uplifts from um, the convection permitting model that at the time had been run for the convex project. We're updating these at the moment in a project called Future Drainage for the UK CPA team um, projections. But we need to understand what people need, what, what, what do people need and, um, you know, what, what is the level of information that's needed to make a decision and how sophisticated does this need to be. Um, and finally, I think that, um, you know, it, it, it's going to be difficult to think about um, changing flood risk estimation methods to, to, 
to change the way we use uh, climate uplifts or produce more sophisticated uh, methods. And one of the ways we could think about doing this is actually to think much more about plausible extremes. And I know the Environment Agency are really working in, on this area at the moment, but to use much more storyline approaches to bring together the process understanding, the things that we really do understand as experts, together with um, qualitative information to produce storylines that we can use for risk assessment. So we can base this on a past event, for example, um, and then change that past event to provide information to the decision makers. And it allows planning and management strategies to be tested much more robustly. So I'm gonna finish with this um, short summary um, and then I'm happy to take questions. So we can certainly expect rainfall extremes to increase with global warming. Um, there's strong evidence that the peak intensities increase um, and stronger increases for hourly extremes with anthropogenic warming. Um, in the intense project, we linked together theory, observations, and results from new, very high resolution convection permitting models. And we've actually provided a much greater understanding of the large scale drivers and thermodynamic influence on um, these very intense storms. There's still a lot of uncertainty, though, um, around the impact of changing seasonality. Um, storm size, urbanization, and other effects on these rainfall extremes, and potentially the throughput to flood risk has not been explored enough yet. Um, and I think that the work we've done so far has shown there's a need for this throughput, for these updates to flood risk estimation methods, uh, for the guidance for surface water flooding climate allowances, and to think about new methods, including storylines for plausible extremes um, for the flood resilience review, review and beyond. And I'm going to finish there and stop sharing. Thank you. There we go. That is brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Healy, um, for a super talk. Uh, we've already got some questions uh, coming in. Can I just please encourage others to write your questions in the chat box? And uh, I'll ask you to uh read them out so without further ado if uh, nick everard would you like to read your question first okay thanks very much uh, thanks for a really interesting talk Haley. um my, my question picks up on the, the point you made about um the rain gauge networks i think it was in germany failing to pick up the most intense events and, and my interest is whether that's because of the spatial distribution of the of the rain gauge network i.e the storms are passing between them or whether it's a limitation in terms of you know, capturing that really intense rainfall. So it's, I mean, it's it's the former, um, almost certainly, um, although I know Michael himself does uh, some work on this or has done in the past. Um, so I think that um, the, there will be some events that are missed due to, for example, uh, wind effects across gauges and things like that, or they'll be certainly lower than they should be. Um, but in the main, it's to do with the fact that we actually cover such a limited um, amount of the Earth's surface with rain gauges. I mean, it's less than, if you put all the rain gauges in the Earth um, in one place, it would be a football pitch, basically. You know, so it's really, really small. Actually, we think we've got a lot of coverage, but actually when you think about the actual space and how small these convective storms are, you know, we're talking about something of a kilometer, a few kilometers in size, um, then it's not surprising really that we miss these things. Perfect. You've absolutely given the answer I wanted in my crusade to improve spatial distribution of rainfall monitoring. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Um, and we have a question from Ian Reid. Ian, would you like to unmute yourself and, and show your video if you like? Yes, um, Haley, e excellent talk. Um, I've got a question which is actually related very much to what Nick has just asked, and that is I'd, I'd, I've done a lot of work, in fact, in deserts and so on, where one's very conscious of the facts because there's nothing to get in the way of spotting these things that uh, convective storms wander around the landscape. And it struck me that it, the tracks of these things are actually very difficult to actually predict. So my question is, in fact, how would you take this into account um, given that your modeling of rainfall intensity changes over time seems to be rather more attestation? Okay, um, 
I mean, I can talk about this from two perspectives, I suppose. Um, so one perspective is in a forecasting sense. Um, I know that there's been a lot of work done by the German Met Service on this um, um, in now casting terms. Um, so they've done a lot of work linking together radar observations together with um, forecasts to actually provide better information on where these convective storms are going to move next. Um, and that's really useful for emergency planning, um, for potential impacts, for planning transport network um, uh, management, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think for um, the sort of work we're doing, we're looking at um, future changes. Um, and we tend to actually look at changes in one location. So that's what I'm saying. I mean, in, in some ways, we need to change the fundamental way we do the analysis. We have been doing some work recently, um, actually doing exactly what we're talking about. So we've been tracking convective storms in our convection permitting models and looking at how those change um, between the current climate and the future much warmer climate. So again, looking at towards the end of the century under about a three degree warming scenario. Um, and we found that, um, well, we're about, we're about to submit a paper on this. And I think that the author, Stephen Chan, he's the main author, is probably on this call somewhere. Um, but we found that there's many more of these convective storms in the future. The storm tracks tend to be shorter on average. Um, but, the, you know, there's many more of them, basically. Um, and therefore, the contribution to the total rainfall is much bigger from these type of systems in the warm season in the future. There's a whole load of other characteristics we look at as well. I don't know whether that's answered your question, but I agree with you that it's really hard to, um, to look at these things. And I think it's why people don't really do it. It's actually hard to look at the certainly the tracking, the movement and the, the spatial aspects as well of change. Thanks uh, for that. I've got a couple more questions coming in. Um, apologies if I pronounce the name wrong, but uh, Bidur, would you like to ask your question? Uh, it's. Uh, hello. Yeah. Hi, Bidur here. Um, yeah, just a quick query on, on the tech bit of the extreme value analysis for the rainfall. We have experienced quite a different pattern um, in the, the coastal area, especially where the, the frontal rainfall is the dominant. And as you go inward, the, the distribution uh, and the pattern is different. So that, that's, that's why I'm asking this question. Um, if there's a specific guidance um, from the EA or, or, you know, with respect to method or, or specific to, to an area, Okay, I don't really understand what specific question you're asking. I mean, I, I agree with you that there are definitely differences between, I mean, obviously the yeah. coastal effects um, and um, inland and obviously orographic effects as well. Um, and, that, you know, there's some interesting observations around whether there has been an increase in extreme rainfall and indeed mean rainfall around the coasts to do with the warming um, oceans, actually. Um, and that's something that we're thinking about looking into as well. Um, this, there appears to be some kind of signal, particularly on the, the North Sea side of the UK. Um, I mean, in terms of extreme value analysis, I mean, the guidance, I, I mean, you know, you either do a site specific analysis and fit an extreme value distribution for one gauge, um, which is not what I'd recommend um, because obviously you, you're limited to, to the, that, that length of record and you can't then make estimates of those higher return periods. Um, the other thing you need to be thinking about then is using something like regional frequency analysis um, in some way, pooling data from different gauges, but then you need to be careful. At, um, and you're quite right there that if you need to make sure you've got a homogeneous region, um, which might be that you just um, just look at coastal stations, for example, to give you estimates of extreme values at the coast. 
Does, I mean, I don't know if that's what you're asking. Yeah, that, that's it. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay, okay great. We've uh, got time just for a, a few more questions. Uh, but first, I think it's uh, Stephen Chan has uh, just written a quick follow up to the previous question, which I'll, I'll read out. Um, he says that locations of storms in climate models cannot be taken too literally. Best we can say is some sort of uh, regional, e.g. country scale summary. Uh, catchment scale will be noisy. Uh, I'd like to ask Trevor Bond to ask the next question. Yeah, cheers, thank you. Just uh, reiterating everyone's thanks to Hayley for what was a really, really informative talk there, so thank you. It was just around the spatial extent of storms. You've already alluded to the fact that the duration and the kind of storm centre might very well change because of climate change. And in relatively small catchments, and I'm thinking particularly over in East Anglia, where you know a kilometre here or there can make a really big difference in terms of that flood impact, I just wonder if we've got any sense or any understanding of how the spatial distribution of a given storm might change because of climate change as well. You know, whether the storm centre is likely to be even more centred or whether it's going to be more dispersed and how that duration links into that kind of spatial extent. Yeah, I think that's a very complicated question. Um... I mean, it also depends as well on whether you're talking about winter storms or these convective storms. I mean, in this presentation, I've really just been talking about changes to these convective storms, but actually, um, certainly for fluvial flood risk in the UK, um, it's almost certainly the case that the winter storms are a bigger problem. Um, and changes to those um, are, you know, projected to be very large. So, you know, we're talking about changes of 40 to 50 percent to the peak intensities of those storms um, with the same sort of level of warming, say three degrees of warming. Um, I mean, in terms of what we know so far, um, we expect that storms, well, our models tell us that storms may become more clustered in the future. Um, they, there's certainly evidence that these sort of storms will slow down slightly. So you can imagine them taking longer to, to uh, go across a catchment. Um, there seems to be some evidence that certainly the bigger, bigger of these um, convective systems, yeah, that, that, that core, if you like, that intense core gets bigger as well, as well as the, the whole storm gets bigger, it, it, but the actual intense bit as well gets bigger. Um, in I mean, it's very difficult to say very much about the actual spatial pattern because the way we tend to analyze these things is by taking a composite. So we'll, we'll take lots of storms and then we'll look at them together, if you like, um, rather than looking at them separately. Uh, there's, there's so much work that still needs to be done on this. Um, as I say, you know, until a few years ago, we were running domains of just the Southern UK. In, it's eight years old, this field, in terms of running these climate models. Um, we're now, we've now got to European scales um, in terms of continental scale domains. We now have an ensemble of runs from UKCP local um, at these convection permitting model scales. Um, and I think that we're really, and, and just to say as well, we've got transient runs for 100 years as well from these convection permitting models from UKCP 18. So we're only scratching the surface on, on the sort of things we understand, but hopefully we can make a lot more progress in the next few years. And importantly, I think, transfer this through so it can be used for adaptation decision making. Thanks, Hayley. Uh, I think we have time for just one or two more quickly. But first, Hayley, um, we've had a, I've had a couple of people message asking if you would uh, consider sharing the, the slides from, from today's presentation. Um, yeah, great, we'll, we'll make those available. Um, OK, so I'd just like to ask uh, you, Sheng, to ask their question. Hello, and thanks for the uh, interesting talk. And I'm not a climate scientist, I'm more like a catchment scientist. So I'm interested in how, what you have described, you know, could be practically used for the catchment in the management side of things. So I asked my questions, could you recommend any like a robust hydraulic models which can be run at like a sub hourly scale, you make full use of your new discovery and new knowledge about the climate change at, at sub hourly. 
uh, step, you know, basically to help the risk management. I hope you can understand me properly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think the type of models we use at the moment um, are often conceptual models um, that are used in practice, um, certainly for the hydrological side of things. Um, and it might be that we really need to move towards using more physically based models that are able to capture more of these changing processes and in particular, you know, antecedent conditions. Um, things may, may, I mean, if, you, if you're not capturing the physical processes and relying much more on sort of black box, statistical conceptual modeling approach, it may be that you can't project those changes very well. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, you know, we need to be thinking much more about using um, hydrodynamic type approaches um, particularly if we're interested in small catchments um, and reproducing flood waves um, that might come from these very uh, intense short duration extremes. I don't think I'm going to say um, any particular names of models. Um, I mean, everybody has their own favourite hydrological model. I think that's part of the problem, actually. We're all probably a bit too competitive in the hydrological community. Um, and it would be nice to see more benchmarking, actually, of models because different models are good at different things. There's no models that are really bad at everything. You know, Some models are really good at certain aspects and others are good at other things. Um, so yeah, it'd be nice to see a proper benchmarking study done. Certainly a very, um, very um, welcome presentation from Hayley. Uh, thank you very much. It was very stimulating throughout. Um, thank you all to, um, also to, to Michael and Lucy and formally to Mike for delivering um, the program. In the new year, we will be sharing with you a new program of webinars. Um, until then, I would like all of the participants um, to be thanked for, for joining our online meetings and hope that you can all take a well-earned break over Christmas, even if it's if it's only five days with your families. Thank you, Michael.